The theme of this panel discussion is ecological security and sustainable development. This discussion will explore the need for a cooperative approach focused on joint activities by governments, international institutions and private institutions so as to achieve the goal of sustainable development. I request our panelists to please come to the stage. Ms. Ambika Gandotra, uh, Corporate Relations Director of Green Yatra. She has actively participated in outreach initiatives with organizations to mitigate climate change and restore ecological balance. Now let's start with you only. Um, uh, Ambika ji. So Green Yatra, I have been, uh, you know, I have been seeing, do you, do you want to show that video? Uh, yeah. Do you have the video? Yeah, I think you see the video. It's a couple of, uh, two, three minutes video that will probably encapsulate what Green Yatra does. And then, of course, we'll go to uh, Ambika ji for question. So you have seen the transformation. मतलब एक barren land सब government की होती है और उसको कैसे transform करना ये अंबिका गनोत्रा जी ही बताएंगी. So मेरा पहला question ये होगा अंबिका जी. How's your green yatra contribute contributing towards ecological security? Miyawaki forest आप करती हैं. Maybe you can explain briefly also what is Miyawaki and how can today's youth these people are bachelors and masters doing different streams from, let's say, humanities se kitne hai Okay, economics, 
ओके मैनेजमेंट ओके एंड कॉमर्स ग्रेट सो मिक्स एंड अदर स्ट्रीम्स ऑल्सो सो देर मिक्स ऑफ पीपल एंड हाउ कैन टूडेज यूथ अ के सी कॉलेज स्टूडेंट रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय ऑफकोर्स मास्टर्स एंड बैचलर्स बी एनकरेज टू फोकस ऑन एनवायरमेंटल सस्टेनेबिलिटी वो टू यू थैंक्स um very good afternoon to everybody am i audible yeah okay and uh, thank you so, so much for having me over here at the onset i would like to mention that uh, pradeep uh, tripathi our founder is a very passionate guy and he couldn't be here today and uh, he's in hyderabad we are looking at some new projects there and um, i have come to basically substitute mr tripathi and um let me start by answering the first question you know uh, which is about uh, what is the kind of work that green yatra is doing you know in terms of ecological restoration so um basically the work that we are doing at green yatra is categorized in um let's say two main headers the first thing is about sensitizing people about what is climate change what is climate change mitigation you know about and uh how we can on a day to day basis do small little things in our life to make that significant difference see the problem that i'm seeing is that uh, we are talking lot of jargons we are talking lot of words you know but in terms of even interpretation people are scared to even open their mouth and ask uh, what is the full form of esg okay it may be very simple it may be something like environment social and governance right but nobody is taking the time out to look it up we want to go to corporates also we want to go to schools and educational institutions and simplify the matter because only if you have clarity on a topic can you even venture to do anything about it that's the first premise so we do a lot of work in the space of climate education we reach out to corporates we reach out to schools and you know educational institutions alike and we talk about the various ways climate education um uh, avenues are available now you know they mentioned about how you know youth can be involved this is a fantastic thing to be involved in there is no dearth of uh, people who want to know facts and figures not just because you can memorize it well because they have ground reality when we talk about climate change we don't go and just give boring both boring like statistics about so much percentage this has happened so much percentage that has happened we talk about interesting things or we try to make it interesting um like i want to share one simple um, you know thing with you all today this gulmohar tree which you can see all over bombay i don't know if you guys are aware of this red color gulmohar tree which is all over bombay yeah yeah it is actually an invasive species it is planted all over mumbai and what is an invasive species right it is going to be eating up all the nutrients in the soil and not allow anything else to grow just like there is a saying which says that all that glitters is not gold everything that is planted on soil is not good for it if it is green it is not good for necessary for mother earth okay there is a huge menace that is happening in the name of this lantana plant the government has spent what or is planning to spend 40000 crore rupees to remove this lantana plant and interestingly this plant originates in south and central america and it came to india in the 17th century and it was first sighted i think in the uh, calcutta botanical gardens you know there were multiple sightings but that's when it came here but you know due to pollination bees uh, birds etc it has spread so rampantly and is eating up our soil our already deteriorating so soil health you know which is already in a dilemma is got further deteriorated deteriorated because of this one species called lantana i am 100% sure that a very minuscule of environmentalists are also paying attention to these facts because we are doing just we are working on hearsay we are seeing the first thing that google shows up and we believe it to be the truth you know so this is the kind of stuff that we talk about in climate education also we uh, talk to corporates about you know the calculation of uh, the carbon footprint right from the supply chain uh, you know right from the very first thing from sourcing onwards how the emissions are being generated it is not the end product you know which is there and what you are doing in terms of marketing and making it to the consumer that makes it relevant where was it sourced from because chances are that some natural resource or raw material has been used and gone into it which has not been accounted for now the esg norms are becoming so strict that one will have to bring that kind of focus here 
So when we talk about carbon footprint uh, analysis in organizations, we don't only go and give them the scary picture about it. We also show them ways, simple sustainable ways and tools that they can imply in their organization to uh, rectify the damage at many, many stages. Uh, this is one thing. Apart from that, we work on a model of sustainable schools. It's very, very important. I cannot overemphasize the importance of human um, the impact that nature has on human existence, okay? See, we are, we are just an outcrop of our ecosystem, okay? Uh, there is something known as biophilia. Is anybody aware of this term called biophilia here, guys? Okay. Biophilia is a fancy word, and the word basically means there is an inherent and genetic tendency inside a human being to flourish in its natural surroundings, which is nature. Impact on mental health is paramount. You know, uh, Mr. Singh just mentioned about how his health has changed. Just if he has taken care of those five elements and how they are in, their, in his life in some capacity or the other. Walking barefoot on soil, very simple thing, okay? Just being in proximity to soil and the microbial life, very, very important. Um, maybe you don't look at it this way, maybe Speaking to Gen Z, I'll talk about something like mud bath. You know, the fancy mud baths that are there. What is mud bath? This is what is mud bath. So anytime you're exposed to the natural elements, it has a calming effect on the cellular level. There is detox that's happening. You do not need to go to a rejuvenation center, spa, and put fancy creams on yourself. You can just be with nature and get that system uh, activated, right? So these are the some, these are the some, uh, some kind of things that we talk to uh, when we are talking about climate education. Now coming to the kind of work that we're doing on ground, yeah? So uh, we also look into water body restoration, as you saw. We also, uh, but our main forte is uh, plantation. And in terms of plantation, we do conventional plantation in rural areas. And we are working very closely with farmers, the Wada farmers over here. We have, uh, you know, encouraged them to get into mango plantation. And uh, we don't just look at, you know, going and offering them a sapling. We tell them that when you are doing a plantation, you need to see the girth, the length, you know, of the sapling you're using, the, the health of the sapling, what condition it is in which it is arriving to you, what is the soil that you're putting into it. We do something known as a pit test, which is basically trying to understand how much damage is there, you know, on the soil that we need to rectify before we can expect to have, you know, a flourishing produce, yeah. Um, apart from that, we talk to them about crop rotation. It's very important to understand which crop in what season is going to fix what nutrient in the soil. We cannot do this in a mindless manner, especially now. It's not, it, it's just not feasible, yeah? And uh, so basically, even in terms of when the produce happens, how to get them the right market price for it, you know, like how FPOs are formed. We do our bit in terms of whatever contacts we have so that the farmer not only is handheld in terms of educating him about what, what he's getting into in terms of growth, but also how he can reap benefits out of it because we cannot leave economy out of it. If sustainability is not economy viable, it is a flop. That is just as simple as it, uh, as it gets. Um, we also create uh, Miyawaki forests and uh, Miyawaki is again, uh, basically um, there is this uh, Japanese botanist, he's no longer there, uh, Akira Miyawaki and he basically observed how trees are growing in forests and that um, the, the whole process and how these are self-sustainable is something that he looked at, observed, shared his findings and which has been very successfully adopted everywhere. Recently, Narendra Modi uh, also spoke about it and he mentioned that when we are designing buildings, the landscaping should be done with Miyawaki plantation, yeah? And uh, the reason why it is actually spoken about so widespread nowadays and why we choose to doing this uh, particular methodology is not that we have any dearth of ancient wisdom, you know, on how trees are grown, but if somebody has done some research and it's working, it only makes sense to adopt it and we can fine tune it with whatever intrinsic knowledge we have uh, you know, from our own culture and wisdom, uh, ancient wisdom. So, um, we do a lot of this urban plantation, the Miyawaki forest that, you know, we mentioned about that we are creating. And one particular feature is that it is a dense uh, plantation. So, in one acre of land, we almost grow around 12,000 saplings. 
and it's a very beautiful thing. This is actually a replica of uh, how life exists in nature. We put around three or four saplings together, okay? And they are of different heights, you know? So you'll have like a shrub, you'll have a pre-tree, you'll have a tree, you'll have a canopy, okay? And just like how nature takes care of everything, certain amount of nutrients will be put in the soil by the shrub, which will help the others to grow. In the meantime, the shrub will gain a height and the other plants will take time to grow. So they will provide the next necessary protection from sunlight till the time the other in the cluster shape up. What is the, this is the basic technology I'm giving in a nutshell. There are many, many intricacies involved, to, involved with it. In fact, there is a 17 point of checklist that we look at before we get into plantation in terms of the area we're in, you know, the topography of it, um, water conditions, many, many things. But the one thing that I want to talk about here is that in urban spaces where there is so much dearth of space, this is a fantastic method to create urban forests. And we've had great results. If any of you have the time and hopefully the inclination, please check out the Nisar Gudyan at Navi Mumbai, which we just showed over here, and see how biodiversity is flourishing. I mean, um, I want to share one small little thing about, um, you know, dragonflies. Um, I hope you guys have seen a dragonfly. Um, yeah, so dragonfly is a very, and thankfully it's still around because a dragonfly is just an indicator that there is a flourishing ecosystem existing. You know, this is the kind of, because they, they, these are the kind of species, these are predatorial and this, uh, they kind of survive on a multitude of species. So our knowledge and takeaway is that if it is hanging out over here, that means something is nice is happening in this ecosystem. So, um, so this is about urban forests. Now with the growing demand in terms of uh, biodiversity, uh, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on it. And when we talk about ESG norms, see, gone are the days when we were looking at CSR only. Now we are into the ESG space. And as far as the ESG space is concerned in 2023 is concerned, a lot of focus has come back on biodiversity. Why? Because we are using a lot of natural resources. We can't just get away with reducing the emissions. We have to replenish them. So we create something known as a nature interaction center or a biodiversity park where there is an opportunity for people to engage with nature, not just create a forest and leave it and the company has done this CSR mandate, we have done the plantation and out with it. No, we want people to be in that space to be able to experience the benefits of it. So this is one of the other things that we do. And also we've got into mangroves. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware that one, one mangrove tree uh, sequesters around, um, I think 123 kgs of CO2 in a year, okay? When we talk about restoring carbon sinks back, you know, uh, right now, there are three main ways that we can do it. We talk so much about carbon sequestration, right? Three major things that can help in that is soil, uh, there is forests and oceans. So uh, these are the areas that we're looking at. And um, in terms of students, I would like you all to understand that um, there is a simple principle that you can focus on before you arrive in terms of how you can contribute towards environment. And please uh, listen up because this is something if somebody had shared with me while I was in school or college, it would have really helped me and saved me a lot of time. One thing is you should take time out from your cell phones and your digital platforms and just look within yourself for some time and see where are your interests in life lying today, you know. Without the influx of all the content that you're looking at, please see what is interesting to you. What is it that is you're passionate about and good at, okay? The third thing that you need to look at is what is really required to be done in the world today. And fourth is how is it economically viable? Whatever you come to at the intersection of these four things is something that you should be doing in life. That is the thing that will work for you. These four parameters should be addressed. So um, in the field of environment, there is just abundant amount of opportunities that you can venture into. Like I told you, the ESG market, just the consultant market, you know, in ESG and sustainability is at a whooping $39.3 billion as of 2023. All right. That's the kind of monies that are being pumped into getting the right kind of data to understand how consumers are, uh, what kind of products consumers are using and how we have to be conscious about what we are doing to our environment. 
Um, apart from that, in Green Yatra itself, there is abundant opportunity for you to partake in researches, come and educate corporates with us, uh, conduct sessions, talk to farmers, uh, be a part of the plantation drives, come and take up a forest with us and uh, do the journey of three to four months and see the magic of creating an urban forest firsthand. And I promise you, your phones are going to be so boring compared to when you see real life sprouting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, Sadhguru says, uh, ecological sustenance and the inclusive, inclusive nature of, of spiritual process are inseparable. I am talking about ecology and spirituality and health. Okay. Just quickly, one or two minute max. Okay. Please explain. I think you will be able to better explain this. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I am really sorry. I know what hunger pangs can do if there is not a process to understand it. But um, I am going to be fast about this. See, the fundamental thing that we need to understand is that we are an outcrop of the ecology. Okay? It's not the other way around. The only reason that we are feeling this separatism is just a lack of perception. All right? Just the very fundamental thing that Sadhguru talks about, if we are talking about Sadhguru here, he says that one half of your lung is out there. What the plants are exhaling, you are inhaling and vice versa. Can we do without air? I mean, energy comes way later. You know, we are talking about fundamentals of human existence here, right? Can you do without air? Can you do without water? Can you do without food? Where is the soil health coming from? It's coming from the nutrition content in the... Uh, where is the uh, nutrition value coming in the food from? It's coming from soil. The organic content in soil has dropped from 1% to 0.3% in the last 70 years. And uh, please, please hear this out, just, just two minutes of your time, that if the organic content in soil is not 3 to 5%, it is unfit. It is not considered as agricultural land. We went through this uh, massive pandemic and everybody spoke about immunity and good health, right? Where is the immunity in the body going to come from? It's coming from food. Where is the nutrition in the food coming from? It's coming from soil. We can take care of water cleaning, we can take care of air cleaning, but we cannot manufacture soil and this is the fact, all right? So soil health is integral to our existence as a species on this planet. So when we talk about spirituality, let me please uh, take another minute and say that spirituality is not something out there, not about following anything. Human being is naturally a curious species. Even we use the word as a curious cat, this terminology, which basically means fundamentally we are curious about everything. When you channelize that curiosity and bring it inwards, when you want to understand what are the dynamics of human mechanics, that is spirituality. We buy a simple phone and technology gadget, we want to understand the user manual to get good at it, right? We can fidget around and also figure out the gadget. But we want to understand how our mind works, how our body works, that is spirituality. It's as basic as that and let's not confuse it with anything else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Actually, this is very close to my heart, but of course, at some other time, you know, because um, I followed the ecology, I followed the nature and what I am. Thank you. And Ms. Ambika Gandotra. I now request our Vice-Chancellor, 